Welcome back. Today's Canaan Architecture Draw Along session, a one hour sketch of the Erechtheion in Athens on the same mount that we'll find the Parthenon, Temple to Athena, Nike, among others. We begin our, our move through Western civilization through the five major periods with classical architecture. And we'll be doing it through a media of design markers. We'll start with number two, 20%, and work our way to 90%, number nine. So you should have in front of you a set two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And the base sheet for the Erechtheion which you can either download from the PDF or you can simply screen capture this, stop the film, print, and return with your 11 by 17 preferred size. You could do it smaller, eight and a half by 11, but if you do it a larger and then eventually reduce your image, you'll have more quality detail inside your final sketch. So let's begin with finding the boxes in space, which is our premise for all the perspective here. As you'll see in the photograph here, if we're going to draw from the Western face, the famous caryatids, the, the feminine form of sort of the actual anthropomorphic idea of a human being as the column itself. And we'll sketch that language in a second. Faces south here, turns the corner and faces west with the major temple front. And then a second row wraps around and faces then the north face. And then also on the west side is another extension of this at different levels. So it's a very unusual type of complex on the Parthenon, Parthenon side of the Acropolis there that's got a whole array of classical temples sort of merged into one um, mass here. So what we'll do first is we'll pull back from the model form, which again shows the caryatids facing south, the western elevation, the northern elevation, and the eastern elevation. So I'll come back to the model a little bit as we draw. But what we'll find then is we take a key angular element coming down from the north face here, and then one to the right coming down on the southern elevation of both where the caryatids are and the temple proper you'll see it's pointing down toward the horizon line. And then we have a couple of tick marks of um, demolished stonework, part of the restoration process, obviously thousands of years of change of use of this as well. But the ones that are in alignment with it are projecting up to that vanishing point. So we've got a whole series of horizontals that are gonna lead us to that point of reference in the sketch itself where you see the camera lens is showing the eye height of the person who took this photo. And that'll be right about at the base of all the boxes proper. So right here where we see them come down, there is the eye height of somebody walking on the site. So that's our view shed. And so what's gonna happen is we're, it's such a large structure and we're, we're far enough away from it that no one side really dominates. So really our key corner is this break point right here, this vertical line that comes down toward the horizon, which will be the establishment of our principal box as we look from this direction. We're going to be seeing the top of this box come down and the base of it back up. So that face of the box comes down and it hits our horizon line. And there's some that goes beneath it, beneath our eye height, but that's gonna be encumbered by the stones that are out in the front, our foreground, which we'll tend to later. And the same is true over here. We got another box that has its edges vanishing back to the same points, obviously, because they're all parallel in space, coming down and kissing the horizon line. And then they both return to the opposite aspect over here. So this will run back on this direction. The base of the caryatids. So it's just a whole series of boxes that are adjoined. Even when we come to the eastern end, 
the actual entablature floats above the lost roof line here. And so that'll return back to our left vanishing point and then come to its front face. And so we have the edge of the box of the Eastern temple front on this edge of the sketch. So we have one end over here, which we barely see at this edge. We have the other column over here facing north. So any horizontal line we're going to draw on the sketch today will have to go back to those distant points, which in my paper right now comes probably about six or seven inches off the paper coming down to the right vanishing point and the left vanishing point. So we're going to continue to kind of float through the basic masses of the building. And what we're going to do to sort of um, break down the box now is show the typical Trabiation of how we move from the base of the temple area. So there's always a certain distance off the ground that moves the people as their procession towards the interior rooms to the base, the box we've done. And in this case, there's a six style. So we need to draw in one two, three, four, five, and six. So those six columns now, oops, we got the last one over here as well. It's actually kind of co-joined into the wall and behind this other one a little bit. Those columns are part of the language of the human form and their proportion and ratio is based on us. So once we complete kind of laying out how the columns are ensconced in these classical elements will break down and say how the human figure actually sort of dominates the language of the classical language here. On this side, we have two that face us as it, we're seeing the side of this temple and there are the tops. And then as that goes back in space towards the right vanishing point, we'll see a third that'll be in shade later. But that's, that's actually one that's facing the north. These two are facing the west over here. But that's the last of the columns we'll see in this temple front. And then the last temple front we see sort of in full form, full, full in a box, are the karyatids. And so they're little, I've had the little kind of uh, pre-notes in there of the figural scale of the head itself. Let me come down to one last one here. And the body form are these lovely women draped in gowns which we'll just kind of loosely fill out now and put in a little modest detail later, because obviously over time, they've lost a lot of the detail. The original ones aren't even on the site. These are replicas because they're very important and they're, they're stored in, the, I believe, the Parthenon Museum. So uh, then we see the underside of this box, the open air kind of interior volume there behind the carriage edge, which rushes back to the right vanishing point. And from this corner on the underside, it goes back to the left vanishing point. So we see a flat, entablature above this, and then instead of having traditional Ionic, Corinthian, or Doric columns here, they've got actual human figures. And then we have a um, sixth one that's actually right here on the edge where it meets the corner. One last lady. And they're projected up high, so you see the level change from the ground level to the various heights. This one steps down over here, this one rises up, and the backside is even different there. So the function inside is kind of adapting along with the classical language. And finally, we see the little glimpse on the edge of this box. This is all uh, solid stone facing south, but we'll see that frontispiece of one column standing by itself, which is the start of yet another colonnade on the east side, which we don't see because it's eliminated by, in our view shed, by this massive wall in the front. We'll put in the boxes here later in the foreground. It'll be easy stuff towards the end. But now let's back up to what we're looking at and, and why it looks like this. So the Erechtheion of the temple for Athena, uh, Pelias is an ancient Greek Ionic temple. And Ionic is one of the formal vocabulary of designing a column the, the trabiation for it, the size, the scale, the proportion of it. And it was pri primarily dedicated to the goddess Athena, much like the Parthenon itself. And the Erechtheion itself was home to several different cults, Poseidon, Athena, and of course, Erechtheus himself, hence the name, the Erechtheion. 
So what we're going to do here is look at the human figure in scale. And a lot of times we've drawn them in sketches in the past, other media with a head on the horizon line and then a torso and then the legs. So let's use it as a scale to explain these columns. The, the um, aspect of developing a column is based on the ratio of the width of the human being relative to its height. At the top of the column, there's always a head or a decorative element. So the order itself, that we'll do it later in terms of what type of language here, the ionic column capital that's developed for these, is the feminine form. And so what we'll find in human nature is that a man will have a ratio to it different than the woman. So the way you can find this out, if we sort of draw maybe a longer gown to show the female form here, she will have potentially the same height as a man, but it'll take a, a thinner porch at the base, a breadth or a width of the base of the feet gives a, a more graceful type of movement to it. And the ratio here, and if you went to your foot, for instance, you can find your own ratio. There's your heel, big toe down, little toe. So from the middle height of your middle toe to your heel is X. That's a certain distance and it all changes for all of us by millimeters. But in general, that distance relative to your height creates a ratio. So X is this length. So that's the width down here. And then six times X is the ratio for a man. And seven times X is the ratio for a woman. And then the Colossus, the Corinthian order, can be eight and larger for those Oh, so the, the masters of sport, the, the sort of uh, Goliaths of the world had that sort of mythical proportion that's the most grandeur. And so the most prolific temples would employ the Corinthian, the more delicate, ornate, feminine goddess would get seven to one ratio in the Ionic, and the more masculine stout um, is the male six to one ratio. And obviously all human beings to this day carry that same proportion which gives them a systemized way to build in the vertical realm. It keeps it related to the language that the gods gave the human form. And so by doing that, they create that order of prose and prosaic notion of developing the heights of the buildings. So we're gonna use that throughout all these things as we sketch them in in terms of that uh, language and approach. And so formulaically, as long as you, you could expand out to an eight style, and then we'll talk about and plan why this depth is as it shows. But that eight style could only be a six style on some. It's a four style here with the women. And so there's just simply as mathematics and geometry, which starts to give this um, predictive idea of mathematics engaging architecture. So the women are um, on the south side here. I believe the Acropolis has five of the caryatids and the British Museum I believe has one. And the whole group is made from pentelic marble. So it's a great spectacle here. It's got to maintain its grace on the, on the hill after all these years. It was used as a Christian church, a palace for a bishop, a residence for a garrison commander, like, like all the architecture that you draw from ancient times. If it survived, it's because it had more purposeful use over the decades and centuries. So let's do a little more value here by stepping up away from number two and into number three as we kind of make our way across the development here and start to articulate a little bit of shade and shadow. So if we assume the same angle of inclination of the sun that the photograph does here, we'll keep it on the south side. And it hasn't turned, as you can see here, it hasn't gone beyond midday. Because once it goes, goes beyond midday, it'll start to light the west side as well. So this is probably more 10 a.m. in the morning where it's all on the southern exposure. And it's pretty bright crisp. It's not like a dawn. So if we follow that, we're going to keep all the elements and forms that face south page white. And then we're going to do a quick cloak of value on all the forms that face west. And so we can simply go left to right here. 
And we're not concerned with final detail yet, but we'll simply establish that throw of the columns we see. This one's much darker there. And then there's a space in terms of how this moves about where we see a bit of the edge of this temple over here in that face that'll be lit in light now, but we'll probably cast a shadow on that eventually. So we'll keep that white and then we'll come back to the largest part of the complex, the tallest part. And you probably want to move the strokes of your uh, element here in the horizontal fashion of where the stone is moving. So when it goes vertical with the columns, just treat those as such coming down this way. And we'll adorn those with more values and move through our set of two through nine to make them more rotund and make them move in space because now they look sort of flat because we just have one line of value on it. And the same is true with the base here. Just come back and I'm gonna score that out really quickly. The base here is actually, it, it goes down beneath the base over there. It steps beneath it. We'll see it over here again. These columns rise down here, but we can't see the base of those columns because there's so much foreground of stone from over the years that eclipse our vantage point of that. We're going to be more true to the reality of it. And we'll have in the foreground here sort of a pattern of grid-like box that are close to the horizon line, so all the lines are flat but they're breaking our vantage points of seeing that base. So the stones themselves will be part grayed out and part light as we move that base across. Then by the time we move over to the, to the south side of it, we actually see where it meets the ground. So the only time it actually comes down towards our horizon line and beneath it, it's on the south edge. But then pretty soon in the foreground, again, it's eclipsed by the debris of time out in front of it. And so we'll fill that in a little bit. So I'll keep wrapping around this face. Faces west is darker. Um, all the caryatids on this side are darker, but even more so, the back side of the caryatids here get a dark shade to it. But now the whole underside of this is in shade. So we're going to start with the value three here, but we'll use a lot more later on. So be careful now because you still want the whites of their heads to show. You want to pull those off the back wall. So you want to work value in and around the tops of the caryatids here as we make our way on the underside of that porch. And that carries down in between the caryatids. And again, we'll come back with other value later and complete that. And that runs to about here in the back porch. And the last two will show more, will do more value to pull them off of the white skin behind them. And now on this side. And what's nice about the markers in this case, because if you use the chisel, it kind of has that stone cut, cut quality. So for instance, if we come back here and we did that, it almost starts to look like stone block and we can kind of symbolize the stone with bits and pieces later on to give it that textural quality. On the top of the fire entablature up to its cornice line, the pediment, most often the pediments you see in the photograph, lose their structural integrity. But the horizontal beams tied to the columns can resist time more so than things flying up in space. And of course, on top of all this, the projects across the space were wooden members and then tiles on top of that. And they are the most fragile material there, so that doesn't exist in any of the ones. So when we come to the corner over here that faces south, we'll see part of the entablature return towards us in the corner. So we'll see the edge of that. And then the whole backside of the entablature we'll see going back to the left vanishing point. So that's how we kind of edge that corner. We've edged it here, and then we'll edge it here once we project our shadow. So our next step is just to move up to number four. And each time we do this, we probably use less and less the value coming out of the actual uh, markers themselves and then develop more detail uh, with some pointed use of the material towards the end. Okay, so the next step is to uh, use number four and maybe we'll, we'll start with the fine point rather than the broad stroke because the broad stroke gave us the initial value here 
will come in with that detail point for smaller areas and zone out a heavier dark now on the underside of this ceiling skin, which is vanishing back to the left point in front of us, it turns the corner and returns back to the right vanishing point. So this is where you've got to always be aware that wherever you are with horizontality, it's matching the flow of all the horizontal lines off the page to the right here. You can't all of a sudden tip this down too much or flatten it out, otherwise your structure will start to be uh, wavy on the scheme here. Now here's a part of its change over time as these things move from palaces to Christian churches to a garrison. Uh, this wall was actually infilled, so the openings were lost, and so we actually have a mural quality behind the columns that comes down completely in this one, if we draw it like as it is today, and then just to about halfway up, because at some point they enclosed the space of the portico and then created interiors with differentiated windows. So by doing this, we leave this void. So we see the sun go through and hit the stone wall of the interior. Now that the roof is gone, with three windows here, and then the wall here is missing from time. So this one stays all white before we get to the corner. So this drops down and we'll address this with its small bits of stone that did the infill, obviously laid around the original intent of the building. And of course we want that to vanish to the left vanishing point, all these spaces, and we'll pick up detail with uh, sort of shrouding these in a little bit. So it's meant to be a portico, a porch, just like this is, and the one over here is, and the caryatids, but again, they infilled the wall for a different use and purpose later on. So what we'll see in the backdrop is coming down from the windows, this corner is eventually seen, so we'll see in the back a little bit of sky different than the wall itself, and we can call that detail out later. Now, in terms of sky, to help this look brighter and whiter, too, you can see between, photographically, between the white of the stone and the brightness of a cloud, the stone itself is a lot more electric. So we want to put a value at the corner of the building here. A little bit of the pediment shows at this edge, and then it kind of breaks apart fairly quickly. But we'll hold on to that piece for now. But then we're going to come to the edge of all of these where it meets the sky, a little projection on this side. And we're simply going to do a space of the movement of clouds kind of diagonally across. And it'll give us a, a chance to put in a value next to the building. And we'll wash a value right up to it. And that'll take right up to the top. And I'll have a return and back down to the other side. And then we'll have it cut through and then start. it goes beyond it. And I'll start up again over here. Again, to match the, the brilliance of the stone being washed by the light from the south. And all around the corner here, and then have it kind of dissipate as it returns down to the ground here. We can return to the two later on to kind of finish out this edge of the building. Because the line will hold that edge, but the value against the line will make it much more provocative. So the, the left side of this column here in space, the back side doesn't receive the light that the sun side does. So that'll be a nice contrast for us. And then, for instance, the back side here is stronger and darker on this column than the ones that actually receive light from the west. And the underside is much darker. So we're just going to start to highlight the things that we think will show some value change of depth. So the wall that's built between the columns is set back from the outside skin of the wall, so that receives a shadow line up there. And then obviously back again now on the wall behind the caryatids. It goes back in space. 
in the top being horizontal back in there. And then to hold on a little bit of that movement of the human form here, again, it's not turned into a column or it's all rectified. It keeps that anthropomorphic form of the human figure here. And then the other side as well. So you have to be careful because you don't want to lose the highlights of the human figures there. So be gentle with the tip of the pen and maybe leave a little bit of white between the plane of the back wall and the top ceiling there. This is a highlight to turn that 90 degrees. So that's as much as we can get out of the, the movement of the four here. If we want to start some of the base, we simply continue with the notion of you're abstracting almost in, again, a graphic sense. We don't have to detail exactly where these stones are down here because they're not the subject. We want to just show an array of cut lines that sort of create the quality of stone being there left for thousands of years on site. It, some might be purposeful today in the restoration process as they move across the Acropolis and try to repair and sustain what they've got. And then definitely want to have that bright sunlight come down and create a nice base of reference where there's an edge between what's really lit up well in the foreground. And then once the sun hits that and casts a shadow, it's dark next to the base of the building in the distance. And those darks will help hold all the stone up on the, the mount of the Acropolis. So up the ladder now to number five. And we'll simply return to some of our form making here at the top is the top piece, the underside of the cornice, will, which will project a dark line here and that edge condition. And that turns a little bit here and then stops. There are the uh, reference point, even though it's not a stone, when they did their early columns, and you can do this out of a number two, so it doesn't be too much information for us, but when they did their the language of the column as it comes from the ground and springs up to the capital, then the capital receives the horizontal member. So that's number one, the column. Number two is the entablature horizontal, which, you know, it's columns and beams for us now. And above that is the pediment, which is triangulated and floats above these so that the wooden members can have its tensile capacity and span the whole space. So it's one great single space. So initially, these were all done of wood. The columns themselves were wood before they developed the stone technology. And so it kind of is a memory of the language of the wood. Above each column, and we'll go back to the number five here and point, each column up here in the language of moving vertically from the tops of the columns has sort of an old stone detail that looks like uh, almost in a sense, the edge of wooden beams coming out and projecting. So it's almost like they're looking back to history saying, well, here's how we used to out of, out of wood, and you'd see the end of the beam itself. Now it's just a decorative piece that harkens back to that time period. And then it'll show up with all of these on the way, and some of it's in, in more of a deleterious state, but certainly above each column capital, you can kind of indicate that with a quick three or four line sketch. And those are referred to as the triglyphs which are interstitial uh, mass void, mass void, mass void, mass void across the way. Uh, and then we'll see a little bit here as well about the caryatids. And these are very rare to see the actual human form itself. It's usually always abstracted with this more uh, geometric patterning there. So number five will help us give more value again throughout, come back to where four was. Instead of doing the entire space, you do corners of it or edges of it. So you see now information within the dark. So as you move from four and five to nine, we're going to use less and less of the ink, but we're going to return to some of the areas because now we know there's always gradation. So for instance, what was drawn here with one, I think we laid a four over a three, we'll start with the five at the top and then simply dissipate 
because light bounces in from around it and lights up the base quicker. And then as it bounces off the stone here and goes up, it diminishes. So the darkest part of the columns at the top section of it, and it's lighter at the base. And so we'll do that sort of throughout the whole sketch now where we're looking under these walls, that's planar. And so the underside, right where it meets the outside edge is gonna be darker. So that's where the thigh belongs. And then potentially on the, the this side of every column, there's a little bit of a, not a cast shadow, but a, a way that doesn't let the wall be lit up as much as this side, because it's coming from the south. So the north side is a little bit darker edge for these, which will make these columns seem more three-dimensional. The underside of a little bit of pediment that's shown here would cast a shadow. And then the actual angular part up here casts a shadow onto the freeze up top. And go back behind our karyatids. And then again, this element up here projects beyond. It's like, as you look at the profile of classical architecture, it's designed to protect the stone beneath, much like the human form has got a forehead that protects your, the rest of your face from um, pollutants and water and things above you, protect your eyes. The eyebrows then protect your eyes as well. Your, eye, your eyes are recessed, so they're covered. They used to have eyelashes, so if something comes close to you, it closes the eye. So they're looking at the natural form of what the gods created in the human form, and they're trying to identify that with the architecture. So that comes down and it protects it, so that this goes out further and creates a shadow for us. In all these cases, this one gets truncated because it's we've lost that over time. And then again, in the back, the light will come in, it'll keep the whole wall back sort of photographically, but we're going to move it more by having a grade eight lighter at the bottom and darker at the top. So we can start at the top and just simply kind of drop it down. So a hard pressure at the top and let go as you drag it down to the bottom. And that'll make that wall, you know, move that much more for you in terms of what it's doing on the site. And then this is just blistering white here, so we'll leave that on for now. We'll bring the two back into it to vary it and make it look like stone as we kind of finish the sketch in about 15 minutes. And then take the five and the base over here. So adjacent to that, you can then articulate some more stone that these people might be next to. As they kind of give scale of the whole project there. Again, vary to have the tone in their frame itself or just their legs or in their hair tone, just so they have that kind of human form. You don't have to detail them the subject. And then sometimes all you see are the lines that are between the stones here. And sometimes you see vertical lines that are having shadows cast. So again, it's it's a randomization of just simplifying this sort of very intense foreground of boulders on the ground. And then sometimes they'll turn the other direction toward the left vanishing point. But it's kind of in a, a very um, close plane to us. We don't see a lot of dimensionality, but obviously that as it drops down the page, it's going to make them more projected as a three-dimensional volume because you'll see both, both sides of it vanishing back to points. And we'll, we'll keep building this up as we step through the higher values of design markers. And now we've got this notion that this is casting a shadow from the light. This is in shade that'll cast a shadow down here. So we'll keep the top of this very crisp, but then we'll have this run down. So this remains white and this whole edge is now in shade. So we can use our five to come across here and separate those two then with the cast shadow.
Okay, then we'll move to number six. Again, we're sort of just, you go back through the sketch again. If you wanted to be done now, you could and say there's a 40 minute sketch. But if you want to take the full hour, you just sort of go back in with our numbers now as they raise up to nine and you'll draw less. So each wave now is quicker as you sort of pronounce the building with your value range. So now again, left to right with the number six here, 60%. Again, follow the edges and now draw less than the corners, maybe the break right at the column height and the left side of the column there, potentially the left side of the column against the sunlight there in the foreground here. And then when it comes to the ionic, let's, let's step back really quick to number three, just so we don't uh, make a mistake on the column capitals. In this case, it's a feminine form, the ionic. And so that, Topping for it, if this is the top of a column here, simply has large volutes on both sides. And then a flat head to it that's received on the entablature above. So we want to project out in the front and then wrap around to the back. So the volute is three-dimensional and then it rounds around to the top there. So three-dimensional on the front and there's the third one we see on the right here. I'll do the same up front here. The column's going to have two there, and we'll see the third one. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. That's not, you know, a detail of it, but it gets, it shows that you're committed to the language of this particular temple. And so three protects you because you can make a mistake with three and then clean it up with the other markers later on. So now I can jump back to the six and show that the value here against the sky might have a dark edge to it, and this one might have a shadow, and the back one is in shade. So that's how we get the idea of Ionic and this temple fairly quickly. So just by light, shade, and shadow, you can kind of articulate that. And then right where the column comes and meets the underside, there's a little arc or a curve that shows the rotundness of those column capitals. So being large cylinders in space. And that helps out. And now adjacent to that, we'll just simply do a little bit more of the six before we leave each zone and come back to the underside here and say there's a darker shadow line within the shadow line. And that edge against the sky here is important. Inside the triglyphs, they're casting shadows of three against each other. So maybe two lines within those can hold those triglyphs more. Certainly at the edge of this whole building now, the center temple part, there's a nice strong edge because you're defining space between the two. And that shadow line will be sharper and coarser right by the edge of those two. And it comes to the corner, goes around the edge. Maybe strengthen this line along the way against the sky. And now the back side of the stone coming back to the left vanishing point here. We can make that a little bit stronger. Whisper toward the edge and that'll help pull that up towards us. This edge can get stronger here. And now the back side of this column, which we hit earlier, and then the bright wall. And we keep that nice crisp white between them, which pushes that column off the edge. And in the distance, we might see a little bit of vegetation just above the horizon line there at the base. And now right at our corners, right where the light turns dark, this whole gray appears the same tone of the human eye, but on the paper you want to read darkest right where it makes that corner. So now we can take the six and come back in, let's see, here. come back in with the marker and take a corner right to the edge there some of the stone and just vary it and almost kind of create a range of details there that doesn't become too predictable and lose its kind of sketch character to it and do the same at the corner of as it melds into the next temple top here or breaks in the next piece 
do that as well. You can just do the single line, the join stone, or show the actual connection there, and then do a little bit in the foreground as well. And now we'll move to number seven. And we'll take this into the area, which is up to the sky pushing through there. So right here now in the back of the space, from there to there, we can see the sky run through there. push that seven right against this edge opening. So we get that collapsing of volumes by having our brightest next to our darkest. In between at the top now at that corner, maybe that becomes darker. Maybe that turn where it projects over that side. We'll come back in and make that a darker edge of the, of the clouds right in there. Underside here, hit that again. Our profile, the whole building coming down to the other edge of the columns against the backdrop of that wall that got installed there. Those windows, which are punched out fittings. And now the, the back side of the carriages, just the least little bit of line work on their northern end. And not even a continuous line, just enough to edge that and then on the tops of them there actually is a bit of a, a flare out where the tops of their heads much like the columns flare out the idea is when the column rises up it splays so it, it receives the forces on a diagonal and then creates a lineal element down and takes the forces down to the ground so they're not this decorative they're working here as well And perhaps over far on the right here, darkest at the top, coming down, darkest at the edge, little shadow line, shadow line coming back. And now at the base too, because you want the whole thing to sit down. And so there's some key aspects over here right at the base. We want to go dark as well. And if we back up to maybe a five, in the distance here is actually another hill in Athens you see in the distance. So in this direction, we're looking at more of the actual Acropolis. And so it goes off in the distance, then you see sky. On this side, it's nice because we see sort of the distant edge of another Athenian hill. And so it'd be nice to show that in the distance as a different tone than the rest of the building here. And that gives a little sense of its setting as well. So I think we could probably take that same number five and um, come back with the corner of our front building up here and pull that back. So give it a hard push and then let go as you draw it back this side. And then I'll crisp it up that edge against the sky. Up there. And we'll make sure we do that return white against the sky. Now, if you ever run across a completed classical building, probably uh, neoclassical would be complete now. Some things from antiquity are close to being fully formed. It's much harder to draw because it's complete and perfect. 
It's razor sharp. It's very analytical, very mathematical. The geometries are very pure. So you have to be very, very precise. When you come to a ruin, it's very, very um, leisurely in terms of there's hard to make a mistake because it's in a ruinous state. And you can just say that's that's what it looks like. And so it gives you a lot of leeway in terms of developing the image. I'm inside with the seven again. Certainly it's darker on a plane that's opposite the sun. So the sun comes down from the top. It can bounce off the floor and light up the back wall, but it lights up less and less here. And it's a very difficult time going back to the underside beneath their heads. So one of the darkest areas is that roof line on the inside of this porch. And that'll help pull that out and really show the ladies far away from the skin of the building. Okay, number eight now and nine go quickly. I'll be a minute each as we simply go to where we've got our darks now and we add to them. So basically, if you're looking at the form and whether it's projected from a model or from a photograph or you're on site someday, hopefully, and uh, if you imagine that you squint down so you can't see it at all, so you close your eyes and look at the form, whether it's a photograph of it or something online or a model of it, when you squint down and you can't see this photograph, now open your eyes, you're really attracted to the brightest white and the darkest darks in terms of moving to the building. And so that's where you want to squint now and say, have I completed this by showing those absolute uh, ideas of darkness? So in number eight, we're going to come back in and show a little bit of vegetation that's grown over the year, which happens to be not really foreground, but it certainly is at the base of the building over here. And it's a type of pine or evergreen that can handle the great Grecian sun there. And we're gonna start with an eight there and show some of its body over here. And it'll project out in and around some of the stonework. And then kind of dies off quickly, but then we see some more projected off here, smaller scale to the left over here. And it's in and around again, the stonework there. So nature is making her way between the rubble of mankind here. And so it kind of helps accent what's happening. If you want to soften a bit, you can drop down to number four and show some of its body in a different tone that might help complete it. But that's a good way to create sort of a, a value base that works its way from something that's very close to us and moves you to the building proper. And then take that eight and move into what you see as the depths of darkness here. And so we already established those areas. We're just gonna go deeper in with the eight now and show that underside and this underside, leaving some of the old gray still in there. And then coming back to this corner of this column and having that move down, we can go up to the underside of In tablature that floats over the interstitial wall that's in there. It's a very handsome dark. The dark over in this corner of that part of the architecture, maybe one or two ticks in the triglyphs on the left corner to drive interest on this edge. And maybe the edge itself would have something darker right at that point where it loses its connection over time. Uh, there's no real way to see the darkness in the space because they walled it all off. So that's what we're left with, sort of like a neutral gray with the brights of the building being lit behind it. So our next dark to work with is back to the Caryatids. And so probably just beneath the beam that supports that, it's the absolute darkest. And then maybe a bit at the feet beneath the Caryatids in the distance is also a dark. And the distance probably right at the corner here can go darker as it turns its corner and the underside of the other temple front starting to make the turn around the corner. You could then bring some of this down to the line work at the base of all the buildings where they join the earth. But I wouldn't take too much over to the right. Keep your focus right here and then kind of let it lay off to the right part of the scheme.
And the last little bit is really just for in terms of the markers we're using, number nine is just the black is black. So within the base of this, we'll go on the inside of it and show yet another black inside the dark eight. Use the underside, the lower third of it. Maybe some of the cut lines of the stones adjacent to each other, how they sit on the ground, shadows they might create. Now you can make your assessment in terms of how it's gone. You can drop back in and return to some of them. For instance, we could take the three out. And now knowing that this is all this stone, heavy cut stone on these skins of the walls. And so we've got a media that does that fairly well. If you don't use the whole flat of the chisel and use sort of just parts of it, you can come and do little bits of movement of horizontal lines across this kind of randomize them along the way. This one actually seems to be a little bit dead in the middle of the actual pad here, which kind of almost helps because it gives you white and gray at the same time. And then just do, some might be full stroke, some might just be the lines themselves. And it starts to hint at the idea of being a very heavy stone building. So you break up all your skin so it isn't clean white. Make sure you're always going back in perspective in terms of the strokes of lines. Hold on to that. Maybe this against the sky could go darker on that column there. These might be brighter on this one side compared to the other. And we can articulate corners and the edges a bit along the way, turn the corner and show even in the white areas that we know over time then all the detail, the stone has been washed by so much weather that it ends up showing more of its age and it's in a sense the architectural wrinkles over time. And then maybe drop down to a three. And then show a bit more at the base as it meets the ground and turns to the white. Maybe up your corners. And now we'll come to the sky and kind of do pushing some of the value of a two or three into the existing stuff. And that might groom out some of the line mark or strokes you really had. Maybe start with the two here so we don't overkill, but to show more of the same cloud work. This is stuff that's very close to us, to the exact same form, but probably about this big in the distance. And that might cut through the columns here too. And then that form would be probably just two lines worth there in the distance. And then there again, so it falls back. And above us might be an even larger one. Bring that over here on this side of it. So the Athenian sky ends up in the sketch very quickly. And then taking the two or the three and just sort of rubbing it into your, your original edges. So you blend all that's there by washing. It's almost like merging this with watercolor now. You can get more texture than 
and the, sort of the antiquity kind of burned into this. So there we have our view from a multifaceted erection, looking from about this angle. Several levels, I think that compensated for some of the uneven bedrock there, divided into two cellae, one dedicated to Athena, the other Poseidon. Compared to other buildings that's on the Acropolis, it's really sumptuously detailed. A lot of uh, luxurious moldings and types of stones used on the site. And so we've lost in terms of the sketch is that all the decay end up being the first, probably eighth or ninth of the base of the drawing here, filled up with the blocks from the rest of architecture around the Acropolis. So it's hidden behind that. So we lose that portal there and front edge that point. So next up, we'll move to another period in the classical language, we'll move to classical Rome and we'll work on a draw along of the Colosseum.